You can do that. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the garden hours today. Debbie Kelly is off today. She's in a meeting. So I'm Ramona Rancivia, and I will be the host today. Uh, with me, there is Justin, who is going to be the moderator. Donna is going to be in the uh, chat. And uh, Kathy uh, Mechan is going to be uh, answering questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please uh, put them in the uh, chat box under the uh, ask questions here. Um, and of course, Jared is behind the scene, always helping us with, with some troubles with the uh, videos. And uh, so uh, just to remind everybody, um, there are uh, Donna put the snips for the last the uh, link for the last week um, uh, video for the garden hours. Uh, you can look into that. There are other links to different resources like the uh, garden spades, the uh, Missouri produce growers video newsletters, and the garden video other garden videos that uh, Donna might put in the in the chat. And uh, if you have any question, please put them in the uh, chat box and the ask questions here. And with that, we thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to start uh, with a pass it to Justin. He's going to be the moderator to ask it, for us to answer a few questions that you have posted. Justin? All right. Thanks, Ramon. Um, so we had a question come in related to uh, ground covers that might work under a shady area in a tree. And I think uh, Donna Offenberg is going to answer that one for us. OK, so what a great question. Um, you know, the question is about um, ground covers for the shade and semi shade and also ones that are pet safe. And so I'm going to cover on several topics here. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, what is a ground cover? Ground cover is simply a plant that covers the ground. So it can be low gro growing or middle range growing and, you know, as well as covering a good amount of space. And they're usually pretty hardy. Um, some of them can handle quite a bit of traffic, uh, foot traffic, that is. And so that's what we uh, call a ground cover. And they can be low growing annuals, they can be low growing perennials or low growing shrubs. So any of this falls into that section um, that we call ground covers. So the other part of the question was, what is low maintenance or what is easy or carefree? So, you know, I always go, hmm, in gardening, is there really anything such as low maintenance, easier, carefree? Um, there are things that are easier. There are things that are more low maintenance, but for the most part, everything has some type of maintenance to it. Um, so the definition of low maintenance can vary from person to person, but always keep in mind that most plants, if not all plants, um, have to have a plant establishment period where they are establishing their root systems. And this is where the care really needs to take place because a lot of times we can't plant a, um, a transplant in the ground and just walk away from it. We still have to water it. We still have to watch it. We still have to make sure that it's doing well. So just be um, wary of the term low maintenance because everything still has some maintenance to it. Um, you know, another thing that we always try to remind everybody is when we're talking about ground coverage or plants that cover a broad area in a shady area, a lot of times that shade comes from big trees. And when we talk about big trees, we're talking about a large root system. And so that prov can provide a lot of competition for anything that you would place in the ground. Um, so with that thought in mind, 
go back to the thought of low maintenance. Because if you have large trees, you're going to have to be watering more. You're going to have to be uh, supplying more fertility more. You know, so just keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is do your homework. Um, I know part of this question is about pet friendly. And so a lot of our extension guides throughout the United States, we don't address pet friendly. We address what a ground cover is and the, and the more popular ground covers, but we don't address um, pet friendly. So definitely do your homework. There's lots of good websites out there that can help you. And the other thing is every plant has a good place that it wants to be in. It's got a desired location. And so I am really a big pusher of plant that right plant in the right place because not everything does well in um, certain areas. So um, if, if a plant is for shade, plant it in shade. If a plant is for sun, plant it in sun. And so just keep these things in mind as you, as you um, start thinking about ground covers and putting them in. Here are some more popular ones, but I'm going to put the warning out there. These are great ground covers, but if you are like, pet, like pets, uh, the cats and dogs, just remember that these could pose a risk for toxicity. Now, what does toxic mean? It sometimes can mean a bellyache. It can mean that they drool a little more. It could mean that they have, start having neurological issues. So the word toxic can mean a, it, it's a very broad word of what can happen. Now, I have a cat at home. Is the cat going to go out and chew on the ivy plants? Mm, I don't know. Um, are, are they going to chew on the mint? I don't know that. But if you are a avid pet lover and you worry about your pets getting into some of um, these toxic plants, don't plant them. Look for things um, that would be safer. Now, if you have a question about safety and toxicity, cons consult your veterinarian or um, you might check out the ASPCA website that has an exhaustive list of poisonous and non-poisonous plants. And that's where I uh, did retrieve some of this information. Um, so good options for pets. Um, and this is shade to part shade. Sweet woodruff is probably happens to be one of my most favorites. It's top right. It has the little white blooms on it, establishes well, does well in shade. Uh, while ginger is on the left top, it very it can be a very aggressive in terms of if it likes it, it's going to spread. And that's what you want as a ground cover in shady areas or semi-shade. Pacassandra is another one that's safe. Um, I tend to lead more, lean more towards the natives, but Pacassandra is also a good choice. Ajuga, and that juga is at the bottom. And then, of course, Jacob's Ladder and Pansies. I, and I have to throw in a few annuals here and there because they are still considered um, uh, ground covers. Good options for sun. Once again, safe for pets. Any of your sedums. If you go to a lot of the nurseries and you see vast amounts of different varieties of sedums, all that is safe for pets. Lamb's ear, creeping phlox, winter creeper, plumbago, um, lemon balm. You know, a lot of our herbs can be used as ground covers, but you have to be careful. If they have a lot of um, oils in them, they tend to be more toxic. The less oils in them, the safer they are. So for example, thyme is really good, um, and, but, but oregano is not so good. Rosemary is not so good. So once again, go to that website uh, um, and, and take a look at um, what is deemed safe versus toxic on, um, uh, for pets. And of course I threw in alyssum. It's a good pollinator plant, but it's also safe around pets. Um, it's something that when you start establishing some of the perennial virgins, you can tuck that alyssum in because it's easy to establish and it's a good annual to have around. Okay. So back to you, Justin. All right. Thanks, Donna. Um, we also had a question come in regarding uh, challenges with fruit trees and clay soils. And so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ramon, and he's going to talk about that topic. Okay. Um, we forgot, I forgot something uh, before to let everybody know. We're still going to have our uh, uh, weather forecast, but uh, Tony's going to come a little later today. So uh, wait for him. He's going to be here. Okay. So to answer this, uh, can you see that picture? That Not yet. Okay. Hold on. Okay.
So the question today, we're going to talk a little bit about planting fruit trees. Do you see that in there? Yep. Okay. So uh, we are going to talk about planting fruits uh, trees. The question was actually, I have a clay soil, a heavy clay soil in my property, try to grow fruit trees in the past only for them to die after one year. Uh, that indicates that probably there was a problem with the planting. Uh, so what can she do or what can the person do about it? So I had more questions, but I didn't get any answer. But you have to consider a heavy, heavy soil, clay soil, is very waterlogging. So if you have a, a clay soil, likely drainage is not very good especially if it's flat ground and there is no slope around. So you have to realize if it, can, if it holds a lot of water and if it rains hard and it doesn't, uh, the water doesn't run off, or even if it ran off, it holds a lot of water, stay too wet, especially in the winter, that would provoke an asphyxia of the roots. The roots needs also to breathe. They need oxygen. Even if, when they don't grow much, but when they, they are growing, definitely they need oxygen. A heavy clay soil has very has a large volume of air, but the pores are so very little that it's very difficult for the water to uh, go through and for the air to get in and get to the roots. So thinking in that say, so question that I had also was this is a flat uh, la, uh, ground or a, a slope ground. And based on that, we can uh, think about a little bit, uh, what can we do? First of all, if it's a slopey uh, ground, we can build terraces. So there's gonna be an area where the, the water will run off, but not where the tree is planted. Yeah, and if it's flat ground, like the picture you see there, those trees have been planted in rich rows about two feet high. In that way, it will drain the water in the middle and it won't stay in the mount or in the rich road, and that will help the roots to grow. Yeah, another thing that we can do is add organic matter to the soil and mix it in. The organic matter will loosen the soil and will increase aeration. Increasing aeration will allow the roots to grow more healthy and uh, be able to grow and breed. And remember, roots also need oxygen. So those are the things that you can do. Add organic matter, plant on a mount or on a rich row so they have a better drainage. Not The tree still needs water, but it doesn't need flooding or saturated soil. They need to breathe. Mm -hmm. So, and other things that you have to consider is how to plant the tree. One of the things that we always said is you plant the tree, if, you, if it comes in a, in a, in a pot, you plant with the roots, with the uh, not with the pot, but take it out of the pot, but only loosen the, uh, you have to loosen the, the soil around the, the, the root bulk or the root uh, 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 bulk. So the roots cannot, uh, you want, you have, uh, avoid the roots growing around the pot instead of the roots needs to go into the soil, not go, go, uh, grow around the pot or the, uh, the, or the root bulk. So you have to loosen the uh, side of that uh, soil bulk where the roots are. Secondly, as I said, plant where the, the, the tree is coming out on the pot, that should be at the same level of the soil. Always leave the grafting union free of covering, no soil, no, uh, no mulch, nothing. They have to be open. The grafting union is a weak area where diseases can get in. If you cover it with mulch or with soil, likely they're gonna, uh, diseases are gonna get in and kill the tree. So you have to think about making sure that the grafting uh, union is above ground six or, or more inches. 
uh, when you plant slightly pack the soil and under so the the uh, the under on the side so the tree when you water the tree it won't settle uh, deeper than the soil level that you have in the ground otherwise you have to you're gonna have to have a you're gonna have a hole then you're gonna fill it up and you're gonna get to the grafting you know you should avoid that you have to put pack the soil a little bit so when it settles after you water it won't get deeper than the soil level and uh, and the next thing is if you see there this is a, a, a nice tree it's a peach tree they planted on the top of the the rich row but they put a lot of uh, organic matter there compost or, or, or mulch debris that is not recommended it's recommended to put mulch around the tree in a donor like a shape that means you don't put it on top of the trunk or touching the trunk the trunk has to be free of mulching or or soil so you won't cover the uh, grafting union that what i'm showing there is not the way you can cover it with that with that uh, plastic around for deers not to uh, rub in there and, and and affect the tree because they wrap in the bark and they 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 kill the 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 danger the they damage the tree damaging the bark and the tree suffers or maybe die so you can cover it but do not put mulch like is in there you have to put it away from the trunk of course we recommend to put mulch but away from the trunk do not cover the trunk to avoid getting into the grafting union and with that, I hope I answered the question of the uh, clients or the person that submitted that question. If I did not, please send the question again and be more specific what the situation is. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ramon. So just say no to mulch volcanoes. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we had another question come in. Um, if you have an ash tree on your property, it's probably either dead or dying. Um, and we had a question come in about uh, using mulch from dead ash trees. And Kathy Meacham uh, will be answering that question for us. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, but I'm on the wrong uh, slide. <laughs> uh, let's see. Still on the wrong slide. I don't know what happened. Let's see. Now, can you see it? Yep. All right. So this has got a, a picture of mulch uh, in this, like a donut as well. And uh, so a volcano would be, you know, where it was piled up on the, the trunk, like we saw in that previous picture. And this uh, question came into my office and we had identified this tree earlier with having um, emerald ash borer. And they wanted to know, they called me then and asked if they could use the mulch from this tree uh, for, uh, uh, could they use it? And um, and yes, but it's important to keep the mulch on the same property. Don't move it around. Just like you wouldn't move the firewood around, you don't want to move um, the mulch around either. Um, there are other uses for uh, the wood. Uh, so mulch is one, firewood, uh, even furniture. And we're going to put a link in the chat that gives more information about that. And like I said, don't move firewood. And that doesn't just include ash. It also, in other woods could be harboring uh, an invasive pest as well. So it's just best to keep things, um, keep wood close to home. And if you're out, uh, if you do go camping and you, uh, and you take some wood, make sure you burn it all. Or if you buy wood there, uh, just burn it. Don't bring it home. Either use it all or leave it for the next camper. And also remember that even seasoned or dry wood can still have pests. There's, um, there were some studies that showed that uh, the emerald ash borer was still in the wood after two years. 
Uh, I wanted to show you a picture in case some anyone doesn't know about the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, this is the adult, and uh, you and they really can. They're a cute little bug, but um, they can do a lot of damage. And you can see their size in relation to the penny. And they are most active uh, from late May to to mid June. This is the larva, and it's uh, as you can see, it's segmented and a flat cream colored. And they feed under the bark of the ash tree, leaving these patterns and S-shaped galleries in the tree. You can see in this uh, picture. And then when the adult emerges from the tree, they leave a D-shaped exit. So that's a um, uh, an easier way. That's an there's a lot of ways to identify it, but if you have an ash. And um, and actually somebody showed me pictures of uh, three or four ashes on her property yesterday. And sure enough, um, it's showing signs of having um, emerald ash borer. But you can see that um, when they emerge, they make a D shape. And that's uh, very identifiable compared to the round that a lot of uh, pests would make when they emerge. Here's another, a uh, couple other pictures. And um, you'll see that about the top one third or more of the ash tree will be in start in decline. And then also you'll see these light areas on, on the ash tree. It's another sign. If you see um, woodpeckers going after your ash, that is also, it could be a sign uh, that you've got the emerald ash borer and those woodpeckers are, are looking for something to eat. And I believe that's all I have. Please, uh, if you've got any questions about this or you've got ash, you uh, call your extension office if you need any uh, information on it. We're gonna drop uh, two uh, resources actually in the chat and um, in, to help you identify and also what, what to do if you do have it. But again, you can call one of us and we can help you identify. And that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we had a question come in, come in related to uh, planting on a septic drain field. And somebody was wondering, you know, is there something they can plant? Um, how far away do they need to plant? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cover that topic now. So um, in terms of septic drain fields uh, and septic systems, uh, for some folks in urban areas, they might not be familiar, but some folks might um, live in a rural area. Uh, as 20% of Americans are hooked up to septic systems, um, this is something for people with existing septic systems, or maybe you, you just moved out to an area and it's your first time uh, having a house that's hooked up to a septic system. So it's basically an on-site uh, wastewater sewage treatment. Um, you generally have a big tank to get the water, uh, to catch the water from the home. And then there's a distribution box that helps channel um, the effluent into perforated uh, pipes called the drain field. And then that drain field absorbs um, that water uh, so it doesn't go off on the rest of the property. The challenge though with a septic system is you have all these pipes in the soil um, those drain field pipes are generally about 10 to 24 inches, but they could be as shallow as six inches, depending on your soil type. Um, and because this area needs to remain undisturbed, uh, we want to avoid, definitely avoid heavy equipment use on these drain fields. So if the soil that's above these pipes becomes compacted or obstructed, uh, the moisture from the distribution of the fluid will not be able to evaporate the soil will not be able to absorb that appropriately. So in terms of what is it possible to plant on a drain field, really, you really just want turf. Um, you don't wanna have any other kinds of plants on the drain field, because um, you're gonna get root obstruction um, and other things that are gonna impact the use of your septic system and the effectiveness of the se uh, septic system. And that can cause really expensive problems to occur. So we wanna have turf on the drain field. Um, we can have annuals pretty close to the drain field, shallow rooted perennials, kind of the next year out. 
And then shrubs and trees, we want to have those planted furthest away from the drain field. If you have any vegetable plantings in the yard, you want to have those uphill from the drain field because you don't want any kind of leaks or anything getting down on your edible crops as that would pose a food safety concern. Um, so prior to planting in an area where there is a septic system, you want to locate those drain field lines. And then there's also something called a curtain drain that can be around a septic system. Sometimes if you have elevated pipe risers, you might physically be able to see where this is located. But in older systems, it might be totally underground and you might need the help of a septic company to go ahead and, and locate that drain field. Uh, in general, the rule of thumb is to use the ultimate mature height of the tree as your kind of setback distance um, and, and add a little bit more distance to be safe. I lived in a home that had uh, an obstructed septic system. There was huge cottonwood trees and it was a really expensive problem to remediate. So for instance, a pawpaw tree might be 15 to 30 feet in height. So we're going to want to locate that at least 30 feet away from the perimeter of the septic drain field. Um, and we have a, uh, there's a good document from University of Georgia um, with some more details that will get dropped in the chat box there. Okay. Um, I know we've had some questions come in related to uh, bringing plants out maybe from a garage, maybe from a basement, or maybe just from inside the house, um, and kind of thinking about how to acclimate those trees and some of the things that we should consider. And Ramon, I believe you're going to uh, talk about that briefly. Uh, yes. Well, I, uh, can you repeat the question that it was? Yeah, it was a question about um, how to like acclimatize plants uh, some considerations for bringing plants. Maybe they were in the garage over the winter. Maybe they were inside yeah. the house. Now I, re I remember I was thinking in something else that Becky put a, a question about the fruit trees there. So I, I was I was ask I was going to ask Becky uh, whether her tree she she needs a peach tree to flower. I'm I'm going to answer the question, but I want to answer the, uh, Becky first. Uh, you have a tree that it needs to be flowered. So I was wondering if that peach tree is grafted or it comes from a seed, from a, directly from a seed, it's a seedling. And uh, secondly, uh, a lot of time peach tree, and how old is it? Sometimes peach trees should be flowering in the second or third year of planting. Uh, but but uh, if a freeze comes early in the season, those buds might be uh, might have been uh, uh, injured. So, uh, Becky, if you can let us know how old are those trees, and if it's a seedling or are grafted. So while, while she answers uh, about the, the plants or trees that are being overwintered inside indoors with very low light or in the garage with very low light, even if you put them in a, uh, by the window, the amount of lights that they get is very little. Yeah. So what happens is if they're growing, the, the foliage gets accustomed, especially the new growth, it gets accustomed to very little light, uh, especially inside you don't get much UV light from the sun. So when you bring it out, you have to give them a time of two or three weeks of acclimatization. That means don't put them straight in the sunlight because it's not accustomed to that uh, direct sunlight, the intensity of the sunlight, as well as UV light from the sun. Uh, it has to acclimatize to the temperature. So you have to put it when the temperatures are adequate for the growth of the plant. So thinking above 60 degrees, yeah. Uh, and then you can put them in a shady area for, as I said, uh, two or three weeks. So they won't drop the leaf or the leaf won't be burned by getting a straight sunlight, just a, 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 a few minutes or, or, or an hour straight sunlight will burn those leaves that are not accustomed to those, uh, that intensity of sunlight or, or UV light. 
So that's essentially it. When you bring your plants or trees from an indoors area to the outside, do not put it directly under the sunlight. Give them some shade to acclimatize for a little bit, a couple with two or three weeks before putting it and slowly increase the amount of uh, radiation, solar radiation, so they can get acclimatized. But even if they drop or burn some leaf, they can come back if you're carefully, you fertilize them and you take care of the, of the plant. But giving a little bit of shade for a few weeks will help not to lose those that foliage. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ramon. And it looks like we did have a comment from Becky. She says she's in the St. Louis area. We planted last spring. It was a seedling from Home Depot. There was one flower, but then it froze and now there's just leaves. Yeah. Well, if it's a seedling, that means it's not grafted. Seedlings take very long time to flower. Actually, even if it, if it showed that little uh, a flower before, it may have had a stressed uh, a period or, or previous year, but essentially when it comes directly from the seed, it takes five or six years to really, and, and, and grow a lot to really start uh, flowering and producing and setting fruits. That's one of the reasons that fruit trees are grafted. Other reason for fruit trees to be grafted is you want the right variety, the peach fruit that you want. But the one of the main reason is to get fruit before when it's normally a seedling will uh, bear fruit. A seedling will bear fruit depending on the tree. It can go from five to seven or 10 uh, years depending on the species. In the case of uh, peach, it can take five to seven uh, years. So if you graft, you can get fruit at the second or third year. So in this case, I would recommend for her to find a way to graft that tree with the variety she wants. Okay, thanks Ramon. Um, it looks like our uh, weatherman has joined us. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mr. Tony Lupo um, to give our weather report. Uh, we can see your presentation, but we're not hearing you if you're talking, Tony. It would help if I unmute. <laughs> okay, so um, I've got I've got good news today with respect to uh, sunny weather, and we'll see temperatures above normal. But there's something we do have to be careful to watch for, and I'll get to that uh, uh, when we look at the maps. But uh, today, uh, yesterday, we were up in the. Uh, upper 70s across most of Missouri, even uh, some low 80s in Missouri. And uh, the temperature change from yesterday to the day before was a, a moderate five degrees across much of the state. Uh, not as much in the eastern part of Missouri, but uh, certainly there. And where are we now? Uh, we're underneath high pressure, so there doesn't seem to be a lot to talk about uh, since the uh, high pressure has been in control since about Friday. But I will say that uh, for many of you, it may have felt extra dry, uh, especially Saturday and Sunday, and it was. The, the dew points that we were experiencing were more reminiscent of what you would get in Arizona, New Mexico, and those areas. And as you can see with these lines on the map, the flow is coming right out of the desert right now. Uh, we do have a low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico that bears watching, especially for Southeast Missouri, but uh, it might bring some rain there on Saturday. But what we have over the continent right now is a very strong ridge in the upper atmosphere. And this type of pattern is actually an early shot of summer, if you will, because uh, 
it's the summer season where we tend to have a ridge settle somewhere over the continental United States. And uh, of course, April and May are both our, our big months for precipitation here annually. So this ridging here bears watching because high pressure and ridging is not conducive to rain. Hey, Even Tony. Though, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, could you put it in presentation mode? Uh, we could see the slides a little bit better. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm you're really, all right. <laughs> I'm so used to teaching my class this way. So, so when you look at what we've had in the last few days, uh, again, the last month or so, the same pattern seems to be emerging that the south southeast part of the state has been quite wet. And we've had pretty close to normal precipitation across the northern two thirds of the state. But again, now we're getting into the time of the year when four and five inches of rain is normal for April and May. And so um, if that, with that, I think we're beginning to see it. We're running a little bit behind and I'll show that. Drought conditions have Again, pretty much left the state, but if you look very closely on April 6th, we had a little bit of D1 or very mild drought occurring uh, probably in Boone County and the county, Callaway County, uh, maybe Audrain County, just to our north and east. But that's about the only part of the state that seems to be uh, suffering any kind of drought conditions. So when we look at, again, March, I told you, had run below normal and it, it, it Boone County, but it ran below normal statewide, St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield, everywhere was a little bit below normal. Precipitation was fairly close to normal. And you, and at St. Louis, it was above Kansas City, pretty close to normal. Springfield, uh, well, that should be 3.5 inches or 3.27 inches above normal. So March was cool and wet. Well, where are we with April so far? April, we're running well ahead of normal uh, temperature wise, but precipitation wise, we're trailing a bit. 1.27 inches already this month. And I don't like that trend. But you're seeing the same thing in St. Louis, very warm, dry. Kansas City, warm and dry. Springfield, warm and dry. So this is happening statewide. And I'd like to say what's changed. Well, let's take a look at what's changed between March and early April. March, again, we had this more zonal pattern, west to east pattern across the state. In April, we're seeing the emergence of a ridging over the continental United States. And when you get ridging over the continental United States at this time of year, it's not always a signal of bad news for the summer, but I can say that this type of pattern preceded the droughts of 1980, 1988, and 2012. And so those are some bad news cases. But again, this doesn't necessarily say that we're in for that quite yet, but it could be on the way. You can see that uh, these patterns show you the difference between normal uh, and what we saw in March. Again, below normal heights across the Northern United States. And the pattern has flipped 180 degrees for the beginning of April. So uh, where we saw uh, tr excessive troughs in the North United States, we're now seeing excessive ridging. So precipitation forecast. Precipitation forecast for the next uh, seven days shows this low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico is going to bring some moisture into the Gulf states and even up as far as the boot heel by Saturday. Uh, this precipitation that's coming through is going to be associated with a cold front on Saturday, but 
I say cold front, but it's not going to be too bad. It's not going to be too bad. So uh, the six to 10 day outlooks, again, for us, mainly above normal temperatures to near normal precipitation. Again, pretty close to normal for us for the next six to 10 days. But what does it look like three to four weeks down the line? The eastern two-thirds of the U.S., uh, they say, will remain above normal for the rest of April. I don't like this below normal business uh, in Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and these areas. So I'm kind of hoping that this three to four week forecast fails. But right now, that's what it looks like, that we're going to see this uh, warmer pattern for the next uh, few uh, days and weeks. Well, since we're having this sunnier weather, I'll just remind you that last week I said we were transitioning out of La Nina and into El Nino. El Nino, of course, is the irregular warming of water off the, uh, the coast of South America and Central America every two to eight years. And this warming water has an impact on the jet stream, which has an impact on our weather for sure. Generally, when we go from La Nina to El Nino, as I said last week, that tends to portend for a better summer agriculturally in terms of precipitation, even if the next few weeks are not looking as good. And again, El Nino influences the weather worldwide. All right, this is the winter effects of El Nino on the world. This is the effects of La Nina on the world during the winter. Uh, like I said last week, uh, researchers used to think that there was no real summer effect for us, but some of the research that we've done shows that it's not the El Nino or La Nina itself, it's the transition from one to another. And the transition from La Nina to El Nino is generally favorable to us. I'll remind you that I do put up a five-day forecast if you're interested in looking at that. And of course, uh, for the next few days, expect a little taste of May. Uh, we'll see summer-like temperatures right through Friday. Most of you will see temperatures around 80 degrees. Some of you in the north, maybe upper 70s, but low 80s in the southern part of the state. Temperatures will start out fairly cool tonight, uh, but be up around 60 by Friday night. Again, we're going to see more of that moisture starting to creep in by a Friday night. Friday night into Saturday, we'll see thunderstorm activity across most of the state. Uh, the cold front will pass through Saturday around uh, the early part of the afternoon in the west, crawling across the state by evening, and cooler temperatures Saturday night in the low 40s for a lot of us. Then uh, after that, back to sunny temperatures, but temperatures more reminiscent of this time of year low 60s to about 70 by Tuesday, and then low to mid 40s Sunday night to around 50 Tuesday. Anybody got questions for me? Okay, well, that's it for the forecast, and uh, I'll stop the share and return it to you, and uh, I'll answer any questions that come up in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate you joining us today and giving us the weather report. Um, folks might be thinking about their vegetable garden, what they should plant, when they should plant it. Um, I wanted to let folks know uh, about a great resource we have called the MU Vegetable Planting Calendar. Um, the cool thing about this calendar is it is unique to Missouri and it's broken down by region. And so the planting dates are broken down in Northern Missouri, Central Missouri, 
and down here in yellow in the southern Missouri. And you might be wondering why this area um, down south has the same uh, suggested planting dates as northern Missouri. And that's because this is the Ozark Plateau. Um, and it actually has similar uh, frost and freeze dates uh, to northern Missouri due to the higher elevation. So this MU Extension Vegetable Planting Calendar is a free resource um, that you can find online. It's a really helpful tool and I encourage everyone who's doing any kind of vegetable gardening to go ahead and, and download this tool. So when we're thinking about planting, we're often thinking about frost dates. Um, so our average last frost date is April 15th. Average first frost date is October 15th. And some of these numbers I'm gonna be referencing are for central Missouri. So if you're in the south or northern portion of the state, these times might be a little bit uh, adjusted. So you can use this vegetable planting calendar tool to kind of figure out what's the optimum date to plant my different vegetables to get maximum production and maximum growth and yield. Um, as you know, there's certain categories of vegetables. Some are cool season, um, some are warm season. And so you'll wanna try to time the planting of these different crops uh, so that you get them in the weather that they really thrive in. So this is what that calendar looks like. It's really cool too, because it also um, gives you information on fall cropping. So we often think of the trajectory of a vegetable gardening season going from cool season to warm season crops, and that's kind of the end of it. But we do have this great opportunity to do fall planting of certain vegetable crops in Missouri. Um, the next slides have some dates on them. These are gonna kind of reference uh, Central Missouri dates. So uh, just download the guide yourself um, for, for dates for North and South Missouri. So our early spring vegetables, vegetables these are frost hardy. Um, so you can get a, a pretty early start on these different cool season frost hardy crops. Um, so for Central Missouri, you know, this four weeks prior to the last frost date is gonna be about March 15th. It's, it's not too late to get this stuff in. Um, you're just gonna have a little bit lower yield than you might've gotten uh, if you planted uh, earlier in the season. Um, our mid spring vegetables, these are frost tolerant. So you can get these in two to three weeks before the average last frost date. Uh, so some of our carrots, cauliflower, beets, lettuce, Swiss chard, some of these great spring veggies. Um, and so these you can go ahead and, and get into the ground now. Uh, our warm season crops, um, these are frost tender. So at a minimum, we wanna wait till after the frost date, but really these crops will thrive a lot better when they're planted in May. Uh, the soil temperatures will be a lot warmer. There'll be a lot warmer air temperatures and these will really take off and thrive um, a lot better than if you try to get them a little bit earlier, even though let's say April 18th, you know, kind of av after that frost date, um, because the soil temperatures are cool and because the air temperatures haven't warmed up enough, you can plant these things, but they won't really take off and kind of hit the ground running as well as they might if you pushed them out a couple weeks later. Um, these are just some of the fall opportunities we have for fall vegetable crops in Missouri. So just keep that in mind if you have some leftover spring seed, you can hit this whole other window. Um, you know, in early August, you can get a lot of this stuff planted. The nights will begin to cool off and this stuff will begin to thrive as you come into the fall months. So I just wanted to show you what this calendar looks like. We have the three distinct planting regions. Uh, looking at beets here, we have both a spring and a fall suggested planting window. Um, there's other information in this vegetable planting calendar. So if we're looking at tomatoes, we have a lot of great information on these different varieties. What are the days to maturity? Um, what is the flavor quality like? And then if we look at just one here, this big beef, you'll notice that it has these letters next to it, V, F, F, N, T. Um, and those are actually disease resistance codes. So as you begun, begin to stack up multiple disease resistances in a tomato variety, um, they, can, they can withstand and be less likely to succumb to some of the listed diseases. 
Um, there's other information in this calendar. So there's information on how much to plant per person. So we can see cantaloupe, three to five hills per person. Um, how much seed for 100 feet of row. So we can see for our, uh, our beans here, we need about 16 ounces of seed for 100 foot row. Um, you also get planting information in terms of the distance. So uh, with our eggplant for hand cultivated, we're gonna have about 24 inches between the rows. And then we'll also get information about the distance within the row, um, which is also 24 inches for eggplant. Seed planting depth. So for each vegetable variety, how deep should you plant that seed? So a lot of really good information. Um, this is really, I think this is a four page document, but a lot of great info in there. Okay. All right. Um, I think that is all I have on the vegetable planting calendar. Let's see. So we got some questions in here. Thanks for answering that, Tony. Um, I guess at this point, does anybody have any uh, questions that they'd like to share in the chat box? Things that clarification on things we covered or maybe things that we didn't cover that you just have a a question on. Um, if you have a question, somebody else probably has a similar question, so feel free to share those in the chat box. I'm, I'm going to clarify one of the, uh, the uh, for the Be Becky's uh, questions. I missed that she bought the, the tree in Home Depot that she wrote in the chat box. Uh, likely that tree was grafted. Uh, Home Depot and, or Walmart or all these uh, nurseries, they usually sell trees that are already grafted. And as she indicated, it had a flower and, and it was frozen in the in the spring. That's why she lost uh, the, the flower. That me, uh, what I'm trying to say, yes, first year, you know, even if it, that flower wouldn't have been freeze, the first year, you don't want to have fruits in the tree. You take them out so the tree established itself uh, first, and then you uh, look for uh, fruits the second or third year. So, but freezes will damage the, the bud. And once the, the flower is uh, frozen or damaged, there is no way to flower the tree this year again. You have to wait for the new growth for next year to flower. So hopefully you will have a good size. If the tree grows too vigorously the first year, you likely may have very little flowers for the second year. Uh, but by the third year, the, the growth should not be as vigorous and you will have more flowers and hopefully fr a, a fruit set. But if a, a freeze come late, that's the problem with early varieties that are too exposed to freezing early in the season. Late varieties are more resistant to freezing. And with that, uh, any other question? I don't see any other questions in the chat. I, I will just say, um, I'm not sure if uh, Ramon covered this because I was reading the chat at the time, but uh, with these kind of temperatures, uh, I know I'm going to be tempted to put my house plants outside. And I think in the coming weeks, we'll talk more about that. But if you are tempted, just remember too, besides light, they you know, they're not used to the wind and they will also dry out very fast with the wind and, uh, and going from the inside to the out. So if you do do that this week, just think about all the conditions um, and, uh, and take care of them so you'll have uh, beautiful house plants. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so if we, we don't have more questions, please, if you come up with questions, we have a, uh, you can put those questions in the website and then, and then um, where for, there is a link that we have for questions on the time, uh, for the time hall, uh, for the, for this hourly uh, uh, garden hour. So if you have questions, please post them in the, in the website. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate you all coming and, and, and join us today. Uh, and remember, let me put something here. And uh, yeah, here's the, 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 the 
don't hesitate in calling the horticulturist that covers your area. We're all here to help and uh, we will uh, be available. And uh, oh, let me see something else here. So, and remember the, the questions and uh, uh, the, this, uh, this uh, 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 garden hour is being recorded. So it's gonna be in the, in the website in M YouTube too. So you can check it again if you want it like any other uh, garden hour video that is in have been posted in the YouTube, M-U-I-P-M in YouTube. You can find all the, the garden hours in there. Uh, hey, Ramon. Yes. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention something to everybody. Um, we do have upcoming, uh, starting May 16th, Missouri Tomato School. Um, where we bring in uh, nationally recognized tomato experts, uh, regional experts, and successful farmers. Uh, this will be a combination uh, hybrid workshop. So we have an in-person lecture in St. Louis, as well as a hybrid Zoom option to view across the state. And then we have options to uh, for farm visits as part of that workshop. One option would be in St. Louis. One option would be in central Missouri, just north of Boone County, and one the other option would be down in Springfield. So just wanted to mention that to folks. Um, I dropped the link in the chat box. So if you're uh, an avid tomato grower or know any market farmers or vegetable growers, um, please share the word on that. Thanks, Ramon. Thank you. Yeah, that's important if you wanna learn a little more about tomatoes. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us and I hope you can join us next week, same time, same place. And uh, we're all gonna be here. Please send questions if you have any so we can address them uh, on, the, on the garden hours. Thank you all. <laughs>